right, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for visiting the Sixth Floor Museum today. My name is Stephen Fagan. and I'm the curator here. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this special conversation with Major William F. Lee. And there is really no greater backdrop for this type of conversation than our uh, Morning a President exhibit. If you haven't had an opportunity to look at it yet, I encourage you to do so. That remarkable flag that we can all see from all corners of this gallery uh, was the flag flying over the Senate wing of the United States Capitol during those dark days of November 1963. And we have with us today someone who lived that experience, who played a small but very crucial role during the uh, funeral for President John F. Kennedy. Uh, Major Lee was Lieutenant Lee back in 1963, and uh, he's going to share with us today his experiences during that weekend. Please join me in welcoming Major Lee to share his story today. Thank you. Thank you. Bill, we got some great pictures to show the crowd today, and we're going to start with this one right here. Now, Bill, just as a little bit of background, you were uh, in the United States Marine Corps from 1951 to 1971. You served your country in Korea and Vietnam, but we're going to be focusing on a time in which you were here at these historic Marine Corps barracks in Washington, D.C. Tell us who we are looking at in this photograph here. Well, the uh, picture you're viewing now is the... Uh Photograph taken at Marine Barracks, 8th and I Street, Southeast. Uh, the barracks building area is in the background, and the picture is of myself with what was then called a special ceremonial platoon, which included the United States Marine Corps Silent Drill Platoon, uh, two body bearer sections, six men apiece, and uh, two color guard teams, four men apiece, along with the color sergeant of the Marine Corps at the time, uh, Gunnery Sergeant Louis Blank. Interesting enough, Sergeant Blank was a private PFC in the Army and, and landed at Normandy mm. and served during the Second World War and was captured in the hedgerows of France uh, as a POW, returned to his country and enlisted in the Marine Corps and we became teammates at the barracks years and years later. Now, these barracks, they're, they're at 8th and I Streets in Washington. Why are these so historic? The barracks was founded in 1805. The then Commandant of the Marine Corps, William Burroughs, and the President, Thomas Jefferson, rode out and selected the site for the barracks. And their criteria was that the barracks be within easy marching distance uh, of the Capitol. A little ironic, in a way, is that the next president that visited the barracks was John Kennedy. Wow, some 157 years later. <laughs> Despite its proximity to the Capitol, it took that yes. long for a president. We actually have several pictures of Kennedy's visit. He visited on July 12, 1962. Uh, is there anything you want to share with us? You were there when his visit took place. Do you have any memories of that? Well, it was an exciting time. <laughs> the barracks was closed. That was a closed parade. That picture is of the Commandant of the Marine Corps at the time, uh, David Shoup who was a Medal of Honor winner, incidentally, at uh, Tarawa, I think, in the Second World War. And, of course, he hosted President Kennedy at his quarters, which is at the north end of the barracks. The barracks is a quadrangle. We're on the east side of the barracks, or barracks and office spaces. The south side is the band hall. and some more barrack spaces in the guardhouse. And the west side has five three-story brick homes, one of which is called Center House, which is the bachelor's office quarters. One was for the CO of the barracks, uh, and the other three were for various generals in the Marine Corps. And the north end, of course, was the commoners' quarters, where this picture was taken. Okay, I see. And you mentioned the parade, so we have a picture of that. Yeah. There's Kennedy and uh, General Shoup. And uh, what, what are we looking at? Is that the silent drill platoon back silent there? Silent drill platoon is They've just come off troop walk and are marching towards center walk to start the routine there. That's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. And we have another picture here as well from the same visit, all on July 12, 1962. What is uh, the president signing here? He's signing a guest register uh, for those people that come as reviewing officers for the parades that are conducted every Friday night at the barracks. I'm a little embarrassed because I haven't done my homework here. The parades haven't gone on since 1805, but I believe they started um, somewhere in the 40s at some point. And ever since then, every person that came as the reviewing officer signed the register. 
And that includes, you mentioned to me, uh, someone who later became the governor of this state. Yes. Secretary of the Navy at the time, John Connolly, who also was a review only officer at one time. Uh, so he signed and registered, and later when he became governor, in fact, myself and the drill platoon and the drum and bugle corps did march in the inauguration parade here for John Connolly in Austin, Texas. You might mention that because you would not, your, your responsibilities weren't just limited to D.C., you would travel. The drill team, we, we performed every Friday night for five months at the barracks, every Tuesday night at the Iwo Jima Monument. Uh, we performed at all the joint service ceremonies, arrivals. So, for example, when Charles de Gaulle or Prime Minister or Haile Selassie came, there was a White House arrival ceremony. We participated with the other four services. Uh, we participated in all the wreath layings, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. The dignitaries came. There was a departure ceremony, whether it was at the White House or the Pentagon or Andrews Air Force Base. Uh, we performed for the Daughters of the American Revolution at Valley Forge. We performed a halftime at football games. We performed at veterans hospitals, uh, which was nostalgic uh, to do so in front of uh, former veterans. Uh, Later, in 1964 and 65, I took the drill team and the Drum and Bugle Corps to the World's Fair in both 64 and 65 and performed up there uh, three times daily. Uh, it was a grind. Uh, performed at state fairs, Dallas State Fair, Arkansas State Fair, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida. Um, wow. And at Fort Henry, Kingston, Ontario, Canada, did a four and a half hour tattoo ceremony. 15, 20,000 people. It was a great evening. And I think what Stephen's going to talk about fairly soon, we also performed a guard at the uh, Mona Lisa at the National Art Gallery when it arrived. You have, you have a story about this. So th this is at the National Gallery of Art, January 8, 1963. Tell us this story, Bill. Um, well, Jackie, I, and you know from, from history that Jackie arranged the Mona Lisa be brought to this country and be viewed at the National Art Gallery. Well, first thing occurred, there was a state dinner at the White House. So myself and the drill platoon did the cordon, which is, we lined the driveway all the way up to the entrance for the state dinner. And when all the occupants came and they were inside, and we sent half the drill team back to the barracks, and the other half, myself, went to the National Art Gallery, and we formed a cordon from the entrance to the gallery L-shaped into the elevator. Uh, on the right were marble steps that went up to the second floor. Everybody was going to come after the dinner, come in and go up the marble step stairway to the second floor, except the president, and Jackie, and his immediate party. I was standing in the cordon in charge by the elevator. It's kind of humorous here. It's an elderly gentleman. I can say that now with ease because I am elderly. Uh, probably in his 60s in his brown uniform, elevator uniform with gold piping. It was an old elevator, so it was hand operated. And he really ran that thing up the second floor and back in about five or six times, practicing, make sure everything would go just right. The president arrived with Jackie, and I think Robert Kennedy and Ethel. I'm not sure if Ted Kennedy and his wife were there. I forget now. And just a few other people were in the immediate party. They stopped. We presented arms. Uh, they were standing right in front of me. Got on the elevator. The doors closed. Four or five seconds later, the doors opened. They got off. The elevator wasn't running. <laughs> so they wound up standing right in front of me, and Jackie and President Kennedy were not more than just two feet away from my face. And as you can see, she had this long, white, beautiful gown on. The tip of my sword was right down there near the bottom of the floor. And all I could think in my mind was, you know, I'm going to catch my sword in the gown. It's going to cause the gown to rip and tear, you know. It'll be a national, it'll be in the front page news here in a minute. But the elevator... This didn't function, and Jackie said to the president, where's the effect, Jack, let's walk up the steps. No, no. Wait for the elevator. A few seconds later, minutes later, 
He said the same thing again and again. He said, no, we can wait. We can wait. The man's worked very hard. Nothing happened. Finally, she said, Jack. I recognize that tone of myself. <laughs> Jack, let's walk up the steps. People are waiting. He said, he said, okay. And he turned to leave, and he turned around and looked right at me, about this far away. He said, don't worry about it. I make all the major decisions. <laughs> And I just stayed there with my stone face, which was my nickname, the stone face. Stone face thinking, right, you know. Anyway, and off they went. Wow. That, that wasn't the only time, of course, that you got to see President Kennedy. We have another picture here, one that I don't think you had seen before today. This is not too long before the assassination, September 5th, 1963. And Bill, that's you uh, leading this, uh, this group of Marines here. And you're on the south lawn of the White House. Yes. You would, you would do things there from time to time. It was the first time that the barrack parade had been uh, conducted on the lawn of the White House. And um, I'm not sure about date, what day of the week it was. But That's okay. I might have had a ceremony that morning as well. But in the evening time, we had to do the White House cordon in the driveway. And as soon as everybody was in, I had to take the drill platoon over to Lafayette Park in the dark. So we went through the drill routine one more time to make sure we were ready to go. And then we came over to the South Lawn, and they had a modified parade for President Kennedy and his dinner guest, who watched from the White House. And uh, had the parade, and did the drill routine, went fine. Mm. I did have some other incidents. Um, with the president, and not to imply that President Kennedy and I were good buddies and drinking friends or anything. Um, there was an incident at Camp David. Camp David is the presidential retreat in the Cockatoo Mountains in Maryland, about 62 miles from the, from the White House. Jackie Kennedy and John John and Caroline were already up there. The Marines guarded Camp, Camp David, and when the president was in, came to Camp David, when he was in, in house up there, and we had to augment the guard, because it was about four times as many sentry posts were involved. So anyway, I was sitting at the helicopter pad in a radio jeep. Uh, I was augmenting that weekend, uh, waiting for the president to arrive, the chopper arrive, and John John was th there, Jackie and Caroline were not. They were up there, but they were at the house, Aspen. And the Secret Service man brought John down over to me. So I picked him up, put him on my lap, and he had a model 747 plane. And then, so I showed him how to land the plane on the windshield, of the, which was pulled down to the Jeep, and talking to him. And then I got a radio message that Marine One was inbound. So I put John John down. Secret Service man took him off to the side. The chopper landed. The president got out. And John John ran over, the president picked him up in his arm, <coughs> excuse me, and they were talking, and while they were talking, President Kennedy kept on looking around towards the Jeep where I was sitting, you know, looking back, and, you know, and finally we made eye contact. He had a kind of a strange look on his face, but I said, well, you know, so be it. And then one time at a uh, White House arrival ceremony, joint service ceremony, you know, when the dignitary and the president would troop the line, review the troops, when he passed the drill platoon, uh, looking straight ahead, made eye contact with him again, and it was just rock-solid eye contact. I know we had seen each other. And when he took a couple steps past my position in the platoon, he leaned back from the dignitary and looked back and just stared at me. And he went on his way, caught up quickly, and I, you know, I knew at that moment, he, the look on his face said, you know, my goodness, it's you again. You know? <laughs> so I felt there was a connection, uh, which came, came to have some emotional results later on. Well, we need to, we need to get to that day, okay. shift from those happy memories to something a little more uh, tragic. Bill, where were you when you found out about the shooting? <laughs> I was playing football flag football with the members of the drill team, the color guard, and the body bearers. 
over yeah. in uh, Anacostia, athletic field, Anacostia. It was a day off. The president was gone. We had no ceremonies. It was fall, no parades. Uh, blessing in disguise. Football game gave the troops a chance to knock their lieutenant around a little bit, you know, legally. Uh, so they were enjoying it. The sedan pulled up. Marine came out of the sedan, ran over to me, and just said, Lieutenant, um, the president's been assassinated. You have to return to the barracks immediately. And we were billeted at Building 58 in the Navy Yard. So we went straight back to the uh, Building 58 in the Navy Yard, showered, shaved, uh, got our uniforms ready to go, and stood by, and were briefed on what was going to take place. And the next time, next thing we were notified was, was we were going to uh, leave and go to, this is the drill team, but it was the Death Watch unit. Uh, the Death Watch is a unit, joint service unit, has one officer and four NCOs at the casket. The officer at the head of the casket, four NCOs, one from each service at the corner of the, uh, of the casket. When the president is lying in repose and later when he lies in state at the Capitol. So the Death Watch team and I left for Gala's funeral home. Um, now, Bill, let me ask you a question here. Are you guys prepped for a situation like this? Um, it's another ironic fact that it, it has bothered me over the years, the fact that President Kennedy was the first president since Thomas Jefferson to visit uh, the barracks, uh, was in an October of 63, uh, over at Fort Myers, the Army base, we practiced the death watch. Uh, from all five services, we were over there practicing the death watch, which is more than me see I. Um, when you stay in the death watch, you're 30 minutes on, two hours off. The two hours off, it takes 20 to 25 minutes to get on ceremonially, and 20 minutes to get off ceremonially. You have to repress your uniform, reshine your shoes, reshine your Sam Brown belt, repolish your brass. The two hours you have off is enough time really to have a cup of coffee. And if you were a smoker, smoke a cigarette, dress up and get ready to go again. Um, so it's just, it doesn't sound like it, it's draining, but, but it really is. And you had practiced this a month before the assassination, not knowing obviously what was going to happen. Yes. Wow. And guess what? There was a snafu, <laughs> there always is, right? Situation, normal, all fouled up. When we went to Gaula's funeral home, two of the services did not send the officers and the enlisted men that had participated in the uh, rehearsal practice session. So they were unschooled. And I was asked by Captain Michael Groves, who is the Army officer in charge of the overall um, death watch, if I would train the officers involved in the, in the enlistment. So we, we did that at Gawler's funeral home is where we were taking initially, uh, although the president was thought to have been brought there, but there was a, it's a miscommunication. He actually was taken to Bethesda Naval Hospital in Bethesda, Maryland, where they did the autopsy, and the uh, morticians from Gawler's funeral home in Maryland were the ones who prepared the body for uh, the funeral. Now, this next picture here, this is at the, uh, the gate of the White House. So tell us, tell us about this situation. Um, again, a little unique. This is a squad of Marines from the drill team. Once we left, we were taking them Gawler's funeral home down to the White House. By this time, it was fairly close to midnight. We were taken down to the uh, second level below the White House. It was a galley down there, huge galley, tables, benches. In another uh, part of the galley were bunk beds, places you could rest, obviously for some form of nuclear attack, I guess. Um, so we were taken down below. And then since the Army Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Sautel, I think his name was, and... Uh, one Marine and one sailor and one Air Forceman and one Coast Guard would be on the first death watch, first segment of the death watch. I was put in charge of a cordon inside the White House from the entrance, L-shaped again, into the East Room where the President was going to lie in repose. 
as the situation normally is in the military, maybe everywhere, we had about two or three false alarms. We were told the president is coming. We got dressed, went back upstairs, formed the cordon, told minutes later to say, oh, misinformation, go back down below again, go back below, take the uniforms off, sit down, oh, he's here, get dressed again, go upstairs. The third time that occurred was close to um, 4.30 in the morning, fairly close to 4.30. I don't know, it might have been around 4. Uh, and it was for real. They came out and formed the cordon, set up, stand at attention, and then the Navy Captain Shepard, who was a senior White House aide, came up to me and said, we have a squad of Marines coming over. They're on their way. You take charge and do something with them and escort the remains up the driveway. My first reaction was, you know, squad of Marines, 4 o'clock in the morning, where are they coming from? Fortunately, they got them from the barracks. They were 12 members of my drill team, led by Lance Corporal Lord, uh, young men like Albert Finney, and um, Ronnie Wilson, uh, Carl Port, Ed McCloskey, uh, some of the members of, of, the, of that unit. They came in. We formed up in the front of the White House. I marched them down to, to the gate, faced them about. They were in two ranks. And something interesting happened. I put them at parade rest and told them to lower their heads slightly so I could walk through the ranks and tell them quietly what we were going to do at this point forward, what commands I was going to give and how we were going to get from the gate to the White House entrance. And at the same time, it gave me a chance to check their uniforms. Not that they weren't squared away, but... 3.30 in the morning, they were taken from their bunks, put in dress blues, and you know, headed for the White House, not knowing what they were going to do. Uh, so I checked to make sure that the buttons were buttoned and the, the collars on the blue blouses were snapped closed. Later I read, in, I think, William Manchester's account of yeah. the death of a president, that the Marines had reverently bowed their heads in prayer on the driveway, we were getting dressed, basically, <laughs> what's happening. But anyway, the president arrived in a hearse, and we escorted, you can see the hearse in the picture behind us, uh, up to the entrance of the driveway. We broke into two, two ranks on either side of the driveway. The body bearers, led by Army Lieutenant Sam Bird, came out, got the president's casket from the hearse, and took it into the East Room and put it on the catafalque that was in the East Room. Now, just to, to clarify, this is you right here. Yes. A little thinner and 54 years younger. I <laughs> believe that's really me. Have this. <laughs> now, now, Bill, bef before this moment, though, outside the gates of the White House, you had an unpleasant encounter, which I think is very indicative of the mood of the country at that time. Tell us about that briefly. When we had come from Gawlers in our individual transportation, I mean service transportation, for whatever reason, the Marine van I was in with the uh, death watch, Marine death watch team stopped at the gate. There was some, some confusion apparently up ahead. So I opened the door of the van to poke my head out and see what was going on. And there were several hundred people already uh, outside the White House, outside the gate. And a woman broke out of the crowd and ran over to me and spit on me uh, and said, excuse my language, you goddamn Marines. Of course, that was the time that you know, Lee Harvey Oswald had been identified in the press and been a former Marine, so she just got a little carried away. The White House police put her back in the crowd. And, and fortunately, I don't know how to say this, Fortunately, it was a spray <laughs> and not one clump, so it didn't, any, didn't do any damage to my uniform. Well, that's, that's good. Now, or my feelings. <laughs> now, now, Bill, that is an a, a, a interesting point, though. Oswald had served in the Marine Corps. Was this a point of embarrassment for you? I think inwardly, yes. Uh, I think our pride is such in the Marine Corps, perhaps all the services, but Marine Corps, we didn't like to hear things like that. 
So it was a form of embarrassment. Okay. I felt so anyway. We have a brief bit of color footage of this moment when you're walking up the White House Drive. We're going to be able to see you uh, on the far left-hand side of the screen. Uh, there's a little bit of narration. This is actually from a government documentary, but let's take a quick look at this. Shortly before the dawn of Saturday morning, John Fitzgerald Kennedy comes home to the White House. He had been the nation's 35th president for a period of two years and 10 months. All right, just a quick clip, but there you are, Bill. Now, what about the clicking? You mentioned the clicking. I was going to mention this when we got to the Capitol. We can, we can wait. We can wait. We're actually looking at a picture of the East Room of the White House, and here you are again, right here. And, and this, is, this is one of the rotations where you're at the uh, head and, uh, of the casket as the commissioned officer. You mentioned earlier that you would be on for 30 minutes and then have two hours off, but 40 minutes of that off time was taken getting to and from. Yes. Now, wh and what the rest of the time was pressing uniforms and shining, shining shoes again. Take us to this moment, though. What is going through your head when you're standing at attention for half an hour in front of the remains of the president? Um, of course, you realize there's no public was allowed when the president lie and repose in the East Room. Nobody there. If you look at the picture uh, off to, as I look at the left, you'll see two priests, two Jesuit priests. Uh, at, I think Jackie's request, the two priests were there the entire time uh, the president lay and repose. Not those two, but they rotate as well. And they were saying prayers, which I couldn't hear, but you could hear the beads clinking against the mahogany altar they had. So when you stand there at the head of the casket, not a sound except the murmur of the two priests, uh, if you let it, it can get to you. Um, the incidents I spoke of earlier about the Mona Lisa, uh, Camp David incident, and the one at the White House where it made eye contact with the president. Uh, it was at my first watch at that moment that those incidents came to mind. I was thinking about them, you know, and, and found very quickly that I started to get caught up uh, in the emotion of the time and made a decision then that carried the two rests that I was not going to let that happen. It was just going to be stare straight ahead, blank out my mind, pay, try not to pay attention to what's going on. And in my case, I, I started doing math problems in my head. Uh, East room is oblong room. The entrances are two. Uh, on the right side, as you look at that picture, um, I don't think we, is this where you want me to go into the, the family mass? Or? Yeah, one of your rotations yeah. is when the family had their private mass. Tell us about okay. that. One thing I want to point out before I get to, if you look at that picture carefully, to my left, uh, there's an Army sentry standing the post in his, his blue dress. He's from Fort Myer. I think later when we get to the Capitol, you'll see a Special Forces uh, soldier, Green Beret, in that position. And that's because Jackie... And the family requested that special forces, the Green Berets, be involved in the death watch because of President Kennedy's interest in the uh, Green Berets. So they substituted uh, for the Army man on different occasions. Um, we stood this watch, and uh, I don't know what, which watch I'm on here, but uh, later on that uh, Saturday, I mean, I mean, I had gotten up at 4 or 5 in the morning, Friday morning, to go to work, and uh, you know, I haven't been home yet. I was over here, and I think I was on the 10 o'clock watch, 10 o'clock death watch, and while I was on it um, with my troops, I could see they're putting up folding chairs at the foot of the casket. You know, so being razor sharp as us Marines are, I figured something was going, going on here. Uh, and sure enough, 
right close to 1030. Uh, Captain Groves came in and whispered in my ear, they're going to have a family mass here in the east room of the White House, and we do not have time to change the watch. So you just stay on the watch and stay at attention. Bang, that's it. Um, so the mass started at 1030. The family mass, everybody sat it to put it in the casket in the folding chairs. Front row was Jackie Kennedy, John, John, and Caroline, Robert Kennedy, Ethel, their children, um, Ted Kennedy and his wife, a lot of staff members, uh, probably some senior senators. I'm not sure. I don't remember. But there was a good 40 or 50 people attending the family mass. Uh, and, of course, the priest. And it went on for close to an hour. And at the end of the mass, the people started to leave and took their, their time, obviously, ease out of the East Room. And then when they were all gone, then Ted Kennedy and his wife came up to the, the casket. At the same time, thanks to these gentlemen here, uh, Mr. Joe Hagen, right, from Gawler's Funeral Home, I think was the director of the Gawler's Funeral Home, came in, folded the flag down, and opened the casket, the top half of the casket. Uh, Ted Kennedy and his wife knelt and stood there for Several minutes, it seemed like. They left, and then followed by Robert Kennedy and Ethel and their children. Same thing, saying some prayers. I could not hear the prayers. I could hear the voices. I could hear the murmuring. Um, and then they left, and then Jackie came with Caroline and uh, John John, and they did the same. And then um, she had John John and Caroline leave, Secret Service man picked them up. And I'm looking straight ahead, but I'm catching this in my peripheral vision because they're right down there. Yeah. Uh, again, I can hear them, but I can't distinguish what they're saying. And then she got up and put something in the casket. Don't ask. Don't have a clue. Don't know. Uh, this time I started to make another fatal error that I was starting to get caught up in what was happening here. Uh, for two reasons. One, it was happening right there, and I could hear the murmurs. And two, I was getting tired because we were way beyond the hour and a half mark now. But, uh, but anyway, she put something in the casket, and then she turned to, le to leave and went about six paces away from the casket, stopped and turned, and it was the most forlorn look I think I've ever seen. Destroying me now, but just about destroyed me. Then she left, and it was over, and uh, I don't think you could hear the troops sigh. Uh, I could feel myself sigh because we were oh, close to the two-hour mark of standing at attention in the East Room when the Mass was over. On, on Sunday, the whole dynamic changes. You're still involved, but the, but the body is taken to the Capitol Rotunda, and here is another famous photograph, and Bill, there you are once again at the head of the casket. Now, you're doing the, the same thing, but the environment is totally different. Tell us what was different about the Capitol Rotunda. Um, well, of course, it was larger, and the public was invited. But there were some small things. Remember I asked you, that you heard the clicking sound when we marched up the driveway? Well, we were in double sole heels and soles, leather. And my heels had horseshoe metal cleats on them. So it sounded good when we marched and when we crunched to attention, you hear the crack. The problem was, at the rotunda, the floor was marble. And even though we entered and left at a funeral dirge, which is 60 steps a minute as opposed to 120, it was like an ice pond out there. Uh, so getting on, the only thought really was this not slipping and falling. And if you just put yourself in that position in a minute and manage yourself, what it looks like on ice when your feet start to slip, you just, you see yourself, well, that's the thought is in my mind. I thought, you know, got to be careful here. 
at the casket itself, the foot of the casket was pointed towards the doors of the rotunda, which were open, 30-some-odd degrees outside. In back, if you look at the picture, you can see some lights at my back. And back of me, in a semicircle arc, were all the TV cameras and all the lights. So when you stood there at the casket, you had 30 degrees on your forehead, 180 or 200 degrees on the back of your neck. You had perspiration running down your neck, down your spine, and in the front, you were cold. And on top of that, there were some 250 or 300,000 people that viewed the casket and the remains at the Capitol. And they were, some sorry, some along six, up to six blocks long waiting, six and ten abreast. Uh, up to two, three hours from the time they're in line to get into the Capitol. Immense crowds. And you look at the picture, you see some stanchions outside of the, of the uh, casket, red velvet chain on it. Initially, in the first watch, they were in much closer. And we had to have them move because in your peripheral vision, you could see the movement. It was nauseating, so they moved them out just a little bit. On top of that, it seemed like every other person that came in took a flashbulb picture at the foot of the casket. Bang, flashbulb. Pretty soon you stand there and you got little red gremlins and yellow gremlins running through your eyes. And, you know, you start to get dizzy. Um, you can hear people sobbing. You could hear them whispering, in some cases talking. And then on top of that, it seemed like every five minutes or so, there'd be a dignitary that came in from one of the hallways. They'd part the crowd, and a dignitary come in at the foot of the casket, photo shoots. There might have been Charles de Gaulle or other premier or prime minister of some country. There were 90 countries here for the funeral. Um, so all that's going on at this time. It, it was disconcerting, to, to say the very least. So uh, having had some um, experiences at the White House, I just decided I picked that spot on the rotunda wall above the doors <coughs> and just stared at that and tried to divorce myself as much as I could from anything going on. Um, so in reality, much of what happened around me was just kind of a blur. Uh, otherwise, again, if you get caught up, it was just, just not good. The, the funeral on Monday, uh, the mass at uh, St. Matthew's and the procession to Arlington, your part was done by then. So you got to watch those moments on TV like millions of other people. Yes. In, in between getting some sleep, I imagine, right? A little bit. A little bit? <laughs> we left the rotunda. My part was done. Some of the men in my platoon, the color guardsmen and the body bearers, their job was not yet done. But for my part, myself and the drill team returned to the barracks at 8th and I, and we were done. The barracks was empty because all the troops were out mm -hmm. in the procession to St. Matthews and then from St. Matthews to Arlington. So. In this picture here, you're getting an Army commendation for your service during the funeral. Tell us about this. Um, yes, the Army... I received the Army Accommodation Medal for my performance uh, at the, uh, on the death watch and also for uh, my performance and training at the uh, Gaulers Funeral Home, along with, you can see in the background, that's Lance Corporal Cheek, the Marine in the background, and Lance Corporal Diamond, they were two of the Marine body bearers. Also, um, not shown in this photo, it was Captain Shepard, the White House aide, was also decorated, and the two Navy uh, body bearers mm -hmm. that participated were decorated. Now, this is General Worley, I think, W-H-L-E, Philip Wiley of the commanding general of the military district of Washington. Looking at this picture of you, Bill, you are essentially a walking recruiting poster for the United States Marine Corps. You are just the... Uh, I, I can't think of another person who would uh, serve as a more iconic image of the Corps than you in this picture. You're a little warmer and fuzzier today than I imagined you were back in this picture was taken. Yeah, but there's some people here from, they're my friends from 
from Plano that are probably not going to let let that statement pass. No. <laughs> Now, now yes, the, I was. Well, matter of fact, this, I am bragging. I was on a Marine, Marine Corps recruiting brochure. There you go. My picture was on a Marine Corps recruiting, recruiting brochure uh, for several years. <laughs> the, uh, the commendation you're getting there is actually in our collection here at the Sixth Floor Museum. You donated that to us in 2013. And we have something else of yours in our collection. We have your sword, which we've seen in so many of these photographs. Uh, it is actually downstairs right now uh, on the sixth floor. So if you haven't had a chance to uh, see uh, Major Lee's sword on display, please go down there and take a look at it. This is a beautiful ceremonial sword. There's a little story about this. Yes, it's a, um, called a Mameluke sword. It was given to the Marine Corps for their participation in uh, getting rid of the pirates at, at, at Tripoli. I wasn't there. <laughs> uh, this sword was presented to me uh, by the troops in my uh, force recon platoon when I was enlisted, man. I was a platoon sergeant, team leader, uh, in parachute recon and parachute pathfinding. And when I left to be commissioned, uh, they purchased the sword, had my name engraved on the blade of the sword, and uh, had it given to me at a ceremony uh, before I reached the barracks when I was in Hawaii. So it meant a lot to me. Well, we're honored and to have brass, you. it's brass, and uh, needs to be shined. We take very good care of your sword, Bill. They do. Uh, if you have questions for Major Lee, you should have gotten those question cards earlier in the program. If you'll pass those to the end of your rows, we'll collect those and uh, go through some questions in just a moment here. Now, now, Bill, something that many of these folks in the crowd probably don't know about you is that you are an award-winning novelist. You've written, is it six books or more now? Uh, seven now. Seven books. And one of these books, The Boys in Blue White Dress, is a novel, but it's very much your autobiographical experience during the, the Kennedy funeral. Tell us about this. But in the novel, I talk about my experiences at Marine Barracks in general. But I use the, uh, my time on the death watch as a means to tell the story. Uh, while I'm standing in death watch, I think back of other times in the barracks. And I talk about my entire tour there, uh, which started in 1962 and ended in December of 1965. Nineteen sixty, the latter part of sixty-two and nineteen, all of nineteen sixty-three. I was the drill, uh, drill team commander, platoon commander of the drill team, the special ceremonial platoon. And I was promoted to captain in December of, <coughs> excuse me, nineteen sixty-three, and took over as a commanding officer of ceremonial guard company, um, which included the drill platoon, three ceremonial platoons, the color guard, and the body bearers. And my ceremonial duties didn't change much. The White House ceremonies continued, par excuse me, parades and whatnot uh, continued for the next, the next couple of years as commanding officer of Guard Company. Um, I left there, Guard Company. Um, the last two years I lived in the, in the Navy Yard. My daughter, Keely, remembers that because she used to go outside the our front porch, see the flag raised every morning uh, in Lucy Park. I went from there to Vietnam. Um, Captain Michael Grove, the officer, Army officer I spoke about earlier, who was in charge, overall charge of Death Watch, unfortunately had a heart attack just a few weeks after the, after the funeral and passed away in December of 1963. Uh, Lieutenant Sam Bird, the uh, Army officer in charge of the, uh, the body bearer detail, Army body bearers and the Joint Service body bearer detail, uh, left Fort Myer, voted to captain, regular time, went to Vietnam and was very severely wounded in Vietnam, uh, transported back to the United States, did a lot of time in the hospitals, recovering, was medically discharged, uh, and, but later he passed away in October of 1984, I believe in his home state of Kansas, uh, Lance Corporal Cheek, Ronnie Wilson, who was on the screen here, uh, Ed McCloskey, David Addison, uh, other members of my drill team came here to Dallas to visit me three separate times uh, while I lived here in the Dallas area at Fairview. 
one of those times, uh, 2008, eight, uh, we all came down to visit Stephen here uh, at, the, uh, at the museum. And we did oral histories with a number of uh, the Marines that worked with you. Now, this particular book, The Boys in Blue, White Dress, we have this available. It's downstairs in our museum store, and right after the program, Bill is going to be down there. He'd be happy to meet you, uh, personalize a copy if you'd like to take home uh, Bill's story of the Kennedy funeral. We have some questions, if that's all right. Okay. They're good questions. I are you going to tell me who asked the question first? No, I have no idea. These are all anonymous. It might be some of these folks from where I live. <laughs> There's some interesting questions here. Was your role strictly ceremonial, or was there protocol so that if someone were to breach the perimeter, were your men ever actually armed? Uh, it, well, the answer is yes, we were armed. Uh, you mean at the death watch? I, I'm, I'm assuming death so, yeah. Watch or even the court, yes, we were armed. Um, you had your sword, for one thing. I couldn't cut butter with that sword. <laughs> <laughs> And I wasn't going to play pirate or anything else with it. We were armed, but it's, it's interesting to note. It's a good question. We were armed, but we carried no ammo. So in the White House cordons or any of those ceremonies, none of their troops are allowed to carry ammunition. Um, so being armed, we had the rifles. I had a sword. Army officers uh, later had a sword. Navy and Coast Guard did. The Air Force, I think, had a pistol. And the same for the White House cordon in the driveway and all the ceremonies. Camp David, much different. Camp David, they were not only armed, they were carrying live ammo, and they were challenging and firing posts. And the post at Camp David, or the main gate at Camp David, was a Marine sentry there, armed. And when the president was not in residence, we had a motor patrol that went around the perimeter inside of Camp David. I don't know how large in acres Camp David is, but on the outer perimeter, there's a chain link fence with a Constantino wire around it. Inside that is an asphalt road, one lane, and on the other side of the road is another chain link fence around the perimeter with Constantino wire on it. That's patrol. When the president is there, there are what amounts to be duck blinds, for those who are hunters, duck blinds back beyond the second chain link fence in the woods in the dark with sentries on with rifle and live ammo. And there are what they call challenging posts. Somebody approaches, you halt. They don't halt, halt. Third halt, fine. No more after that, and it's fire. Fortunately, we never had any of those incidents. Uh, didn't even have an accidental discharge. The reason we were in duck blinds, interesting enough, is that Jackie Kennedy did not want Caroline and John John to see Marines armed with weapons and utilities in the woods. So we had duck blinds hidden from the children. Wow. Uh, for how many funerals were you assigned uh, to death watch duty besides President Kennedy? Me personally? Uh, that's the only one. The only one. We had others for General MacArthur, but I wasn't assigned. Some of my lieutenants were. Uh, how many teams were there? Death Watch teams? Um, well, one from each service. Okay. And um, there uh, was four, four enlisted men, myself and four Marines on my team, and one supernumerary. So when I was on, there were the other services. When I was not on the watch, then the Marine would stand on the corner. Mm -hmm. um, he jarred something there. I, I forget what it was. It just, my 83-year-old mind just lost grasp of something. I forget what, what it was. It's, well, it, it might come back to you. Let me ask you another question. It'll pop, it. pop right back. Did, did any moment from the funeral that you didn't see firsthand move you equally? That's an interesting question. So I guess watching it on television. Well, I was moved, but no. Standing at the casket uh, in the East Room and in the Capitol uh, was really emotional. No matter how hard I tried, it was, it was really difficult. Last question. You mentioned uh, your service in Vietnam. 
The big question, do you subscribe to the idea that had President Kennedy lived, the war in Vietnam would not have escalated? Isn't that a political question? I'm sorry. Go for it. It's your program. <laughs> oh, you're bailing out. <laughs> What was his question here? I don't know. I don't. Probably so. Probably so. What? You, you, it would have just. It would have happened. Okay, so you don't. You don't think that had Kennedy lived, that there wouldn't have been a Vietnam War. Exactly. No, I think there would have been. Okay. But you know, what do I know? All right. Wonderful. I wish there weren't, but there. I think there would have been. Just a reminder: Major Lee will be downstairs signing his book in a few minutes. Bill, thank you so much for service to your country and for being our guest today. We really appreciate it. Please join My me pleasure. in thanking you. Thank you. Thank you.